Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of AB in the Films. It is Oscar night, and if you've been watching the show for the past two and a half years, you know exactly what that means. We start with the dog shit first. So here we go. These are the movies I thoroughly... You know what? I'm just going to call this... I'm not going to call this the worst of 2013. I'm just going to call this dissatisfying movies of 2013. Yeah, let's call it that. Anchorman 2, The Legend Continues. When everyone heard the second Anchorman was coming out, everybody got hyped. I got hyped. And, you know, it, it's funny that I'm actually putting it in this, um, in the dissatisfying one rather than the satisfying one, because when you get down to it, Anchorman 2, it, it does have a good premise. I will say that. It's got a good premise. I liked how it continued the story. It didn't do what the first one did. But it just gets so stupid. I mean, I'm sorry for Anchorman fans out there, and especially people who like the movie. And I like the movie. I said so in my original review. I did like this movie. The second half of this movie, I just keep... You know, when I was making out these two lists, I was thinking to myself, where, where am I going to put Anchorman 2? Where am I going to put... It's got to go somewhere. i got to talk about it. That second half of the movie, it just brings the movie down. I'm sorry. It just does. If you find it funny, that's okay. I mean, there were parts of it that I, 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 were, I, I was laughing at some of it. But, you know, I mean, like, he goes blind and then he, he, sings, he sings to a shark and it's just... Oh, man, it just gets so stupid. I mean... You know, I mean, like, it, it was smart. It was it was good. I, I, lo I love the first half. I was laughing my ass off to the first half. Second half, maybe two laughs. That was it. Um, so that was kind of dissatisfying, you know? I mean, really good for the first half. Second half, not so satisfying. Next one. Monsters University. Okay, just for the record... Not every movie you're going to see in this list is going to be movies that people liked. Because a lot of people liked Monsters University. I didn't. I'm sorry. I just... I, I'm not saying it sucked. It didn't suck. Okay, Cars 2 sucked. We all agree on that. But Monsters University, for me, I just feel that when you compare it to, you know the old Pixar films. I'm talking, like, from Toy Story to Toy Story 3. All those movies in between. They, ha they had unique... Well, not all of them. But they had unique ideas in there. They did. And there are some unique ideas in Monsters University, but I don't know. It's just... There's something about it that feels forgettable. I don't know. It, it, this is just for me. If you like it, fine. Um... I loved the short film, um, you know, that came before Monsters University. I really liked that short film. Uh, what was it called? Um, uh, I think it was The Blue Umbrella with that blue and red umbrella. That was great. I loved that. I mean, if I was doing, like, a short film list or something, that would be on the satisfied list. Very well satisfied. But as far as Monsters University goes, I mean, there were a couple of things here and there that I was laughing at, and there were a couple of things that I thought, oh, that's interesting, that's unique, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, it was good to see Mike and Sully back again, uh, everything. But, um, I don't know. It just, it, like, some parts of it felt cliched. Some parts of it felt like I've seen that before. I, 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 I don't know. I mean, like, I, I wasn't involved in all the hype that it got. You know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't really... I mean, it, it was good. To, it was a good movie to see at one time, and that was it. So, for me... I feel, I mean, it was a bit of a mixed review when I originally talked about it when it came out, but I don't know, it just wasn't, it didn't satisfy me that much. Okay? Next one. The Call. Okay, I'm putting this movie really low on the list because I really, really liked the first two halves of this movie. I thought it was really well done. It was a well-made thriller. I was really getting into it, and I was wondering where it was going to go, um, you know, from this point to this point. Uh, Halle Berry, I actually like. Um, you know, she's pretty good in a lot of things that she does. Abigail Breslin actually did pretty good 
in this. Um, but third half, uh, um, I should mention spoilers here. Third half, I, I just, like, th the first thing I said to myself is, you're really doing this. You're really going to do this. Like, it, like it started off as a, a really good thriller, and then it just goes into... The best way I can describe it is, how can we rip off Silence of the Lambs? Like, if you've seen The Call, you kind of understand why I'm, I'm, wh what I'm talking about. But if you haven't seen it, I, I mean, I, I still recommend it. I still think it's a good movie. Just be prepared to be disappointed at the end. Um, I mean, like, I was so... I was really getting into it. And then that last... The last half hour of the movie was just so stupid. I mean, the guy who ends up kidnapping Abigail Breslin, he turned out that, that he's this psychotic um, lunatic who kidnaps girls shaves their heads and, and keeps and keeps their bot and keeps their hair or something to remind him of his uh of uh, I guess it was his sister that passed away of cancer or something. I don't know. I haven't seen the movie since the theater. But I just felt like that could have been handled a lot better. I mean, like th that just came completely out of nowhere and it kind of ruined the movie for me a little bit. But I still I'm still giving it a mixed review, but that was really I don't know. I mean like I, I can't put that in the satisfying list. I just can't. Um so yeah, once again, mixed review, but still like really y y you couldn't come up with a better ending? Oz the Great and Powerful. There has been a lot of talk about this movie and I didn't see it when it came in theaters. I actually saw it um, on um, later on DVD. Actually, actually for uh, for an extra credit assignment. Surprisingly, um, here's the thing with this movie. Okay, as you all know, or, or those of you who watch who watch the show, uh, I don't like Wicked. I do, I do not like Wicked. I don't know why that is a huge Broadway musical. I love Broadway musicals. I'm a huge fan of Broadway musicals. I don't know why Wicked is so so popular. I just don't know why. Um, and for those of you who like Wicked, I apologize. There's something... Not everybody is on the same page with everything. But Oz the Great and Powerful... Okay, first of all, let me tell you, well, let me tell you what I do like about this movie. I like the fact that... Um, First of all, I like the fact that the first half hour of the movie, spoilers for anyone who hasn't, um, see, who hasn't seen this movie by now, um, but I mentioned spoilers earlier in the video, so, you know, I don't have to keep mentioning that. What I do like about this movie is that in the first 20 minutes, it's all black and white, and it, and it really, for me, actually, it captured that 1920s, 30s, you know, spirit. I guess, because of the way, like, it was shot and then the, and the black and white and everything. That's what I like. And then when um, James Franco goes into Oz, it turns into color. And I like that they did that because, you know, this is supposed to be the prequel to the 1939 classic that we all know and, uh, and love. Or at least I love the 1939 classic, obviously. But um, this is supposed to be the prequel. So I like that it did that. The performances... I thought James Franco was okay. I thought he was all right. Um, Mila Kunis, for what she did, she was okay. I thought she was okay. I still think that um, Margaret Hamilton will own that role forever and ever till the end of time. But, uh, M you know, Mila Kunis did okay. Uh, Rachel Weisz, or Weiss, I'm not sure how, you pronou how to pronounce her last name. I thought she was good. Um, Michelle Williams, I thought, was kind of bland. Sorry, I just thought she was. Um, so those are the, the things I like. The one, the major thing I did like, because I was falling asleep through this movie, I'm not going to lie, like, it was boring. It really was boring um, some, um, as I was watching it. But the moment where I leaped to attention and said to myself, that is really, really clever, what they just did, because that ties in really well with, you know, the original was the last half hour of the movie when um, when when uh, James Franco tells everybody that we have to make um, this projection and uh, they have like a projectionist there and you see like his huge like head as a, as as a, as an illusion because he's supposed to be like a magician or something 
that was clever because that explained if you're going if you're going to make a prequel to the Wizard of Oz, that explains why he's like that in you know the Wizard of Oz. So that I liked. That was really clever on how to set that up. That was really good. Everything else is just boring and either has nothing to do with Oz. I mean, half the time I felt like I was on Pandora, you know, from Avatar. And I'm not a supporter of that movie, by the way. No way. <laughs> um, but uh, but I'm, getting, I'm really getting sidetracked here. But the story, in my opinion, I mean, you you can kind of you kind of know where it's gonna go once it starts. He's gonna get dragged over. I mean, it's the same thing as the Wizard of Oz, but the Wizard of Oz has this timeless feel to it. I can't explain it. It just does. Certain movies have that timeless feel. Oz the Great and Powerful kind of doesn't. And this is directed by Sam Raimi, who I am a huge fan of. I love the Evil Dead movies. I like the Spider-Man movies. I think Sam Raimi can... He is, a good, he is a good director. He can tell a good story. But I just can't give this... I mean, like, there are so many things in this movie that I like, and there's so many things in this movie that I... That I, I don't want to say don't like, but I wasn't satisfied with. That's why I'm calling it, you know, dissatisfied. But, um... Oz the Great and Powerful, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't put that on the satisfying of 2013. And guess what, people? That is the last movie that a lot of, some people liked uh, that you're going to see because I think the rest of the movies that you're going to hear, everybody pretty much either didn't like, didn't see, or never even heard of. So, on to those. Homefront. I have one thing to say to directors. When you're making an action movie, an action movie, and you're doing an action scene, or a car chase, or somebody blowing up like the evil headquarters or whatever, here is a brilliant idea. Don't do the shaky cam. We are sick of it. I am so tired of going into an action movie and seeing the shaky cam. It's no longer a cliche anymore. It comes with the action movie. You know you're going to see it whenever you go in to see an action movie these days. And it not only pisses me off, but it pisses, it, it, it pisses everybody off. Because you know what that tells me? That tells me that you are lazy. You couldn't come up with a storyboard for this. Oh, let's shake the camera around. Let's shake it. You know, people will buy that. It makes us dizzy. And it makes us not interested in what's going on. Because how can we be interested in what's going on if we can't even see it? Now, I know I'm getting riled up about this, and you're probably going, Wow, Andrew, you're pretty mad about this. Well, you know what? I damn well am. I am sick and tired of seeing that in action movies. I'm tired of it. Kill Bill Volume 1. I saw the two Kill Bill movies for the first time in 2013, in early January, right after Django and Jane came out. And in order to do the Quentin Tarantino review I did with Devin Keesler, you remember that episode? I watched the first two Kill Bill movies for the first time. The whole scene with Uma Thurman and the crazy 88s, that's one of the best action scenes I've ever seen in my life. And you know what? Quentin didn't use the shaky cam. You know what he did? He storyboarded everything out. He storyboarded out. He took the time to do it. And... Man, is this movie loaded with shaky cam. I mean, in, in every action scene. And not only that, and, and you know, here's the thing. I, I'm a huge Jason Statham fan. I love him. I think he's a great actor. James Franco I like, too. But is this movie filled with cliches or what? I mean, if you look at the movie poster, really look at the movie poster, there's so many signs and acronyms and all this stuff in the in the poster that just symbolize what the movie is going to be, and you know what the characters are going to be. I mean, you see Jason Statham on the top of the poster, he's got the American flag on him, he stands for justice and America and strong, and, and if you see Jason, and you see, um, not Jason Statham, uh, James Franco below him, he's really, you know, he, it looks like he's in hell, he's a, he's the, the bad man and everything, and, and, like, I mean, it started off good. The, the movie started off good with, uh, you know, Jason Statham's daughter, you know, getting bullied and everything, and, and James Franco takes that to the extra limit. But, I mean, like, I've seen that. I, I feel like I've seen that movie before. And, you know, I mean, like, you really couldn't come up with a better story. 
I don't mean to, I don't mean to, to bring down anybody, but I mean, like, a lot of people didn't even go see this movie, and I'm kind of glad they didn't see it because it's a waste of time. I mean, there's a couple of good things in this movie, but that's about it. And I just wasn't, I just wasn't a big fan of Homefront, and I thought I was going to be, I thought I was really going to enjoy it. I mean, Jason Statham and James Franco in an action movie? 